This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I can actually see a scenario where sales is rolled into marketing at some point, where I think the real opportunity is in predictive analytics, yep. and that's an area that we were really working hard on, is to be able to think about what the customer is going to do before they realize what they're going to do. Marketing right now is kind of the darling out there, the CMO is yep. the target customer with everybody, and you see that. I mean, it, it is with Adobe, it is with Salesforce and Oracle and everybody, with the Snowden incident where, you know, the government's spying on us. <laughs> Trust me, all the marketing companies know 10 times right. more about what you're doing than, than the government does. The center is the customer. They're the ones who are paying for everything. I just saw this as, oh my God, this is like my chance. A quarter of a million dollars, it was almost surreal. You can't just cut out one person in the supply chain in order to solve the problem. Those are the kind of people you want. You respect them, their integrity, their intelligence, their ability, their can-do attitude, hard work. All right, welcome to the third installment of UC Santa Barbara's Spring 2016 Distinguished Speaker Series. I'm John Greathouse, and you can follow me on Twitter, at John Greathouse. We have with us tonight Monty Wilson. Monty has been a senior executive in, at the highest level of some of the largest, most influential software companies in the world, including Adobe, Adobe Oracle, and EMC. Most recently at Adobe, he was responsible for digital marketing operations in all of North America and South America combined. So you can imagine uh, quite a lot of uh, travel. Primarily involved in sales, but um, Monty was so senior that that was just one of the things he was responsible for. And during his tenure there, he, he accomplished many things, but probably the most notable was taking Adobe from a legacy box software solution and bringing it into the SaaS world, the software as a service world. That required a lot of innovative go-to-marketing strategies and a lot of disruptive um, licensing techniques. So prior to Adobe, Monty was responsible for government operations at Documentum. Documentum was acquired by EMC. Monty stayed at EMC for three years, and this uh, really kind of shocked me. During that tenure, he led the acquisition of more than 20 companies. So in a three-year period, that means he, had to, he and his team had to identify a whole lot of companies, narrow it down to 20, and then get those deals done. That takes uh, a lot of strategic thinking, a lot of strategic vision. And so what ended up happening after those 20 companies were acquired and digested by EMC, it morphed the company into one that was much more software-centric. So a company at the end of the day, three years later, had a much more of a software point of view. Today, we're very happy that Monty is no longer at Adobe because Santa Barbara is better off for it. Uh, Monty was, in, was involved in our community before, but now that he's not so often on a plane, he's helping local companies, as well as companies in the Bay Area that he's advising. So he's acting as an advisor. He spent six years working in um, Colorado as the vice chairman of the Information Management Commission for the state of Colorado, and that was actually an appointment made by the governor. But we're quite happy to have him here in our local community because not only is he helping us with our startups, he's helping us philanthropic, philanthropically with a number of charities um, which are focused on children's priorities and children's initiatives. So it's great to have Monty here. Let's welcome him to our class. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, and you just recently got off a plane from Italy. I did, yes. So it's three in the morning for you. No. <laughs> I don't want to remind no, you. I'm not over here in about an hour and a half, so. I shouldn't have reminded you, sorry. <laughs> I actually feel pretty good. So I'm always curious when I interview um, people that are, have, have achieved a lot of success and curious about their childhood. So even before college, when you were growing up, um, you're obviously a consummate sales person. You've managed hundreds, if not thousands, of salespeople. Were you that kid that was always selling something? Were you sort of always hustling? No, not, not nope. at all. Actually, I grew up in a very blue-collar family. Uh, I grew up in Peoria, Illinois. And for those of you who don't know what Peoria is, if you draw a line between Chicago and St. Louis, it's right in the middle. And it was very much a, an industrial city where we had you know, several uh, major manufacturers. My father was a, a factory worker, mm. my mother was a homemaker, and, and it was, it's a fascinating culture because you know, 
uh, in Peoria, you went to school, you went to high school, and you got married, and then you went to work in the factory. Right. And that went on for years and years and years, and that was just the way that that environment worked. And so uh, I knew that that was not going to be for me, and uh, uh, I headed to Texas. Oh. And I and, uh, was very fortunate to get involved with the computer industry at a very early stage. I'm dating myself a little bit here, but you know, I was fortunate to be around when the IBM PC came out, and, and people were still using word processors and things like that, which I don't expect you guys to know. If you go to a museum, you'll probably <laughs> see some of those. Wang. Yeah, Wang, exactly, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But it, it was a, a, an interesting time because you could see the potential. Mm -hmm and it was how does that manifest into productivity and into industries. Um, and so it was very kind of humble beginning um, and was able to you know, uh, uh, turn that into a career. Uh, I think the one thing that really I was fortunate in that I was able to associate myself with some really strong individuals that, that even to this day I still keep in touch with and we kind of grew up in the industry together when I uh, uh, joined Oracle, Oracle was not even a billion dollar company yet. And it was you know, still relatively small, so there was just a small group, not, not small group, I mean, it was still several hundred employees, but right. you know, some of those friendships that I made then and some of those people that became my mentors and my collaborator, collaborators uh, came out of those very early days. And I still, still keep in touch with them, and some of them have gone on to, to great positions within companies like Apple, uh, one of my friends was the CEO of McAfee mm -hmm. and, and things like that. So you just never know, you know, you, you could be sitting today with some of your friends that, you know, may turn into industry titans someday and you, you know, want to continue to foster and maintain those relationships. Yep. So. Yeah, I think it's never too early to start um, cultivating and curating your peer group. No. Because your peer group is really where you're going to draw your co-founders, your first employees, the people that are going to drive your career or help you drive your career. So it's never too early to cultivate those mentors, people that maybe are a little further along than you, but also your peers, people that are going to be working alongside of you. And it's funny, on the same way, I've had people that have come in and out of my life, you know, many times I've come in and out of theirs. And that's where, you know, just that old saying about, you know, doing it right on the way up. You know, just it, you, yeah. it pays off in so many ways. And I just met a person last week on an airplane, and and um, she said, John, within 24 hours, I was just thinking about it. You've touched the lives of five people that I've seen in the last in the last 24 hours. I've seen five people whose lives yeah. you've touched deeply. And then she listed them off, and I thought, wow, that's really that's fun. Like that's something to be proud of. Yeah. And, I'm going to embarrass you a little bit. Uh -oh. John's actually one of my uh, uh, key mentors here because. As he mentioned, I was bi-coastal for five years. I had an office in New York and an office on the West Coast. And as my wife will tell you, I would kind of see her every now and then. But I was gone literally half the month every month. And, and I reached out to John. It's probably, what, two years ago. And I said, John, here's kind of my, my landing path of when I intend to get out of this. Can you help introduce me to the local community? And so I wanted to thank you. No. For doing that, well, so <laughs> uh, it's selfish, right? Because I think you're yeah. you're a big asset to our community. Well, thank, so. you. thank you. But I'm happy to do that, and that is something that I that I do try to do with with folks. Yeah. But thank you for acknowledging that. So some people are born salespeople. I think we can agree that yeah. some people have innate skills or interpersonal instincts that, that are better than other people. But no one, everyone can benefit from from some rigorous. Uh, formal training and at Oracle, I mean that's you know they're they're famous for that. Yeah. What are some things that what are some rough spots or areas that you see students, former students, young people consistently need work on when they come into a an EMC or an Oracle or an Adobe and they want to do sales or customer facing stuff? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think the the one thing that I learned early on was if you're in a company, and this doesn't matter if you're in high tech, you're an industrial company or a chemical company, everybody sells. I mean, whether it's, it's the CEO or the CFO talking to the financialists on the street, yep. if you're you know, in product management, you're, you're you know, selling other organizations to collaborate with yours to develop products and things like that. So everybody does it. I think it's just a, a matter of how you title it and, and how you do it. I think that the thing that I would, would give advice around is be selective about where you go with that um, because there are certain companies that you know are known disruptors, known mm -hmm. innovators, known ground uh, trailblazers, uh, blazers, that you want to be a part of that culture. And there's other companies that have a culture that's you know candidly kind of stagnant. And I'm sure you see that a lot yeah. as well, John, of companies that 
you know, it's just, it's, it's a slow kind of decline. And, and so if you're looking for where, where do I want to innovate, where do I want to learn, where do I want to make my mark, look for those companies that have a culture that complements, you know, what you want to accomplish career-wise, has infrastructure and the training programs to help you facilitate that. And then, you know, find your niche. And when you look at sales roles, I mean, you have the formal sales organizations, and we had that at Adobe and, and EMC and, and, and uh, 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 Oracle, but what you're seeing now is the way that people buy, the way they consume, the way that they make their decision around products has changed dramatically. So, you know, when I look at well, the last couple of years, some of the most important salespeople I had was my product group, you know, of being able to go out there and really right. listen to the customer, understand what they were doing, and help make sure we're addressing their needs. So it's, it, it covers a lot of different titles. Yep. I'm going to get the student, first student question in a moment. Sure. Um, but I'm curious now, I like, I like what you said about culture, but if you're, if you're watching this um, at home or you're listening to this on your way to work or you're sitting here, as a young person, how, how, do you have any suggestions for how you would assess the culture? I think you and I kind of, you know, we know people that work at different places, but if you're not in there yet, what's a, what's a way somebody young could do that? Well, it, part of it gets back to your, your network that we were talking about, you know, because I remember when I was entering in the workforce, you know, you talk to, to some of your friends. Where did they land? Where did they intern? Who did they interact with? Uh, and, you know, maybe one, one more extension from the, that uh, base of people to understand the cultures. Um, I think today it's much easier to understand, you know, what are some of the, the attributes of the companies. You've got a lot of places like Glassdoor yeah. and LinkedIn, things like that, where you can really get a good feel of the culture. Um, and, and I think, you know, it, it's really doing your due diligence up front and then taking it down one level. Because uh, a lot of times when I you know, will talk to somebody, uh, you know, I, I, I want to talk to people. I'll, I'll look at websites to a certain degree, but mm -hmm. whether I'm hiring somebody, whether I'm investing in a company, whether I'm looking at joining an investment group or something like that, I want to understand the people. Because at the end of the day, and I'm sure you see this in what you do, John, is, is you know, we see fantastic ideas, we see fantastic companies, but you've got to understand the culture of the people and, and, and how they work. I'll give you a couple examples. Um, when I first came into Adobe, um, how I came into Adobe was because I worked with Mark Garrett, the CFO of, of Adobe, through three different companies. And so we kind of knew each other's strengths and weaknesses mm -hmm. and things like that. And he kind of explained, here's what we want to try and accomplish. And I met with some other folks that I knew there. And immediately it jumped out at me as this is a culture that's going to allow us to take the risks that we have to do. It's going to invest in the things that we need to do to be able to accomplish that. And you can pick that up by talking to your network, talking yeah. to your people, and doing your due diligence and really saying that. So if it were me coming in cold right out of school, I would leverage my friends of who did you intern with over the summer, what was their experience, you know, and try and extend that network. It's pretty easy to do in today's environment yep. and really understand that and then look at some of the websites that really kind of give you that sneak peek one, one step in. Yeah, I think there's no substitute for actually talking to somebody that works at the company. And somebody, with, you know, maybe not your peer in the sense they're a little bit older than you, but they're not 30 years older than you. Right. And so when they say, oh, we have a cool culture, say, well, what does that mean? Yeah. yeah what does that mean? Does that mean you get massages, you know, once a week, and then you work 90 hours, or, you know, do you actually have a cool culture? I don't know. Yeah. So don't be afraid. But I will, I will say one thing. You mentioned Glassdoor, so not to slam Glassdoor, specifically, but be careful what you read online because what oh, yeah. you tend to find is people that are extremely unhappy will go to great links, just like TripAdvisor, right, or, or Amazon, anybody that's yep. reviewing, they're motivated to slam something, and so just take that with a grain of salt. Sometimes you'll have a couple disgruntled employees that can skew the, the whole review section for a particular company, because I've seen yeah. that with companies that I know are great, and we had a couple people that... Well, and, and I, I couldn't agree more, but it, it uh, and that's why I keep going back. You got to talk to people, absolutely, and people you trust, yeah. and or, or somebody that, that can reference to right. you. And somebody. be aware of the sample size. I mean, like yep. if you go to Amazon and, and read one review for a book, obviously that's not a good sample. Nope. If you see five hundred five stars, and it's probably pretty good. Well, and, and the thing that I found a lot of times, if you look at some of those websites, it may key that question you want to ask when you talk to somebody. Right. It's like, tell me about. Them. Right. Why this. do you think they had this experience? Yeah. Like what happened? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Let's take the first student's question. So at your time at Adobe, you changed their sales model from channel-driven to direct sales model. Sure. In what ways did that impact and improve Adobe? Actually, that was a lot of the reason why I was brought into Adobe. Um, when you looked at Adobe, 
back, you know, uh, mid you know, 2000s is if you wanted Photoshop, you went online mm -hmm. to either, yep. you know, a CDW or somebody like that or talked to somebody, you ordered a box of software, and they shipped you a box. Um, and Adobe knew then that especially at the higher end level with like the movie studios, the large creative agencies, the big publishers, we needed to have a much more direct relationship with the customer. And the reason for that was primarily is we were very customer focused on our development. Uh, when you look at what, where were we going to go from a product standpoint, where were we going to go from you know, an investment standpoint in companies that we were going to acquire and things like that. And so you know, we needed that relationship, and candidly, it didn't exist. It was one step removed where we had a lot of large resellers and sometimes smaller resellers, and we had to rely on feedback from them. The problem with that is that most of those companies, not all of them, but a lot of them are very transaction-oriented, okay? And so that you, you, you got somewhat of a filtered, and to right. your point earlier, it's right. maybe not a complete story around the company. So we knew that we needed to do that. Um, the second aspect is, you know, we knew that we were going to be evolving from just a pure creative product company or a document processing company, whether you're talking about the Creative Suite or Acrobat, into more the marketing cloud. Has anybody heard of marketing cloud? Please say yes. No. <laughs> but, but we knew that we wanted to go in that direction too, and, but it was very evident that we could not do that without that direct relationship with the customer. To kind of explain what we did there is that when you looked, I'll use creative as an example, is everybody knows Photoshop. It's fortunately a verb. Uh, we always count our blessings for that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's a good thing from a, a brand standpoint. Yep. Um, but, you know, we created assets, and ad agencies would use them for print or web design, things like that. Um, but we never really knew what happened to that asset after it was created. You know, how was it consumed? Who looked at it? Where was it distributed? What, you know, what kind of success did it have? And so we knew we needed to kind of complete that life cycle uh, a journey where it was, you know, we create the asset. Now we could see how is that astra asset distributed? How is it monetized? What did the consumer do with it? How long did it retain its message in the market? And then take that content or that intelligence we gathered, bring that back into the creative cycle. So to answer your question, we had to make that shift as far as our direct customer relationship to be able to make that journey and also make that, that from a product standpoint. It wasn't easy, and I think we've all you know, either read the book or understand Innovator's Dilemma because we had a lot of people within Adobe. It's like, oh my God, you can't do that. You know, these customers have been using Photoshop for 20 years. You're going to disrupt them. Right. And, and so there was a fair amount of churn, but you know, I... I uh, uh, I want to give credit where credit's due. Shantanu uh, Narayan is the CEO of Adobe, and he, he was very passionate. So this is the direction we're going to go. We, we must make this journey. So let's respect the relationships we have with the customers and try and maintain those as best we can, but we need to bring them along in this journey. Now, what was fun about all that, if you roll forward to where we are in, in, in today, is that the number of people that use the products has actually gone up because I was sharing this with a group of students earlier is, if you're using Photoshop, Photoshop costs approximately $700, okay? If you're going to use that for one project, you're probably not going to spend $700. Mm -hmm. So either try and get the three, free 30-day trial and get everything done you can in 30 days, or you didn't, didn't use Adobe's products. And so what, you know, part of the, the plan was is if we make this very accessible to people and make it easy to consume and subscribe. So I only need Photoshop three times a year. Chances are pretty good if I'm only paying $9.95 mm -hmm. for those you know, three months, I'm right. probably going to do that. Right. So it's actually allowed Adobe to grow much more into a consumer uh, basis and what I characterize as that casual user that may only use it two or three times a year and, and hopefully you know, created a, a, a better customer experience. Yeah. Well, it's matching that value with the price. So if yeah. I'm getting value today, sure, I'll pay nine or ten bucks for it. But boy, we had some strong hate mail for that first of course, year. <laughs> of course. Well, again, it's sort of what I was saying yeah. earlier with the loud voice isn't always the right voice. You know, so well, you have to filter and, that out. And, and I think that's where you know, I get back to the network of people. We had probably one of the best management teams that I've had the mm. honor of working with there, and we knew that it was the right thing to do. And, and you know, there was a lot of other reasons that maybe we can touch upon later of, of some of the, 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 the things that forced us to, to, to market dynamics that forced us in that direction. But 
you know, we held true to the course and we had executive and board backing and, you know, and, yep. and made the difference. It's hard. I mean, a lot of companies never never do that. So if you haven't waffle. read The Innovator's Dilemma, it's must reading. You guys should read it even though it's 20 plus years old. It's still relevant. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to take you back a little bit back to Chicago. So you said that you, or to Illinois, excuse me, to Peoria. You yep. said that you moved to Texas. You made that move. Yep. Was there, you talked about your peer group that kind of you followed each other around, but did you have a mentor that sort of directed you out of the factory town way of life, or did the mentors come later? The mentors came later. Okay. Um, I just knew I needed to get out. I needed to break that cycle of yep. get married, have children, go to work in the factories. Um, right. But, you know, uh, I was very fortunate. I've, I've had, the, uh, you know, a couple of really good mentors. I had one gentleman very early in my career, a guy named Joe Cure. I still remember him to this day. And he was the, the, the kind of the chief of finance for the, the company I worked at the time. This was uh, very early. Does anybody remember the name Sperry Univac? I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was my first job out of school. Were you um, doing sales? Uh, actually, more on the, on the kind of the product. I was part of a, a team for a government project. Okay. Um, but, uh, but Joe kind of took me under his wing. He was ahead of this project team and, mm -hmm. and, and really kind of showed me the ropes yep. uh, and really kind of helped me understand what was important. Now, Sperry was acquired and, and became Unisys, but they also had a thing called a high potential management training program. And I was fortunate enough to be selected for that. And basically, they took you out of your job for six months and you shattered an executive. Mm -hmm. uh, they sent us off to Princeton for a six-week program and, and really exposed us to you know, some of the senior staff meetings and things like that. And it, it was just such a gift to be able mm -hmm. to see that. Yep. Um, but as I was mentioning, some of the students, is, is I was part of this project team. And then uh, and it was kind of tragic circumstances, but it was also a catalyst for my career. As, uh, everybody remembers the Challenger space shuttle accident. Um, when that shuttle accident happened, Sperry was responsible for the software to refurbish the solid rocket boosters. And um, after the accident happened, everybody was trying to decipher what happened, why did it happen, why did we lose all these lives. We were able to provide all the details to every component of the so solid rocket boosters, mm -hmm. their life cycle, where they came from, uh, all that stuff literally within days of the, the Challenger accident. And, um, the government took notice, and, and because we were one of the few people to be able to do that, and it's like, we, we want more of that. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of launched my career. Next thing I knew was moving into Washington, D.C. and getting more involved oh, yeah. with the Air Force. And, yep. And, and, uh, and so that helps you when you went ended up at Documentum many years later, you sort of knew the ropes on the governmental. Yeah, I spent probably, gosh, two-thirds of my career in the government side. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, you know, that was uh, a fascinating experience. Um, because government is different than 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 private sector, uh, and it's hard for small companies to do it. So I I've yeah. written about it and I've talked about it in class where startups typically should not be trying to sell to the government. It's it's a big company game. It's not a small yeah. company. Yeah, and it's, it's a company of major investment and a lot a lot of patience. So yeah. I, I could a not agree. Patience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, now the good news is there's companies now that. All they do is help newer companies and introduce their technology. But to yeah. John's point, but maybe as a sub or something. But yeah, I would never ever yeah. recommend as as a board member that it's a brutal. company go into government. Um, well, it, 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 to kind of help you understand the problem, is the government may have a a problem, uh, but the technical decision and the procurement process are completely decoupled. Right, right. And they can't really talk to each other. So you may do all this work, develop the correct solution for the government, then it goes off to the uh, procurement group, right. and it's, you're, you're starting all over. And they don't want to know what happened over here because of bias and things like that. So it, it's a, I, I don't miss it. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I, I don't blame you. It's, I never wanted to do no, that. No, I, I, you know, it's funny, though, because I did it for so long, so long. I guess I just didn't know any better. Well, you were good at it, and you had the reason. Yeah. You weren't doing it. From, I was always the small company person selling to the bigger company. So yeah, I, yeah. I, I which is the challenges. right way to do it. But, uh, you yeah. know, it, it's, it's once I got over on the private sector side, it's like, why did I wait so long? Right, right. <laughs> well, it's good to do both. We're yeah. going to get another student question in a second, but I just want to touch upon um, all the M&A work that you did. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of companies in a short period of time. Somebody in this room, I'd say at least half a dozen or more of the people in this room are going to sell a company someday to a bigger yep. company. What were some of the pattern matching things that you just, you know, was quickly wrote a company off or said to yourself early in that process, hmm, there might be something here. You know, obviously beyond features and functions of the product. But yeah, that's a great question because um, 
it's interesting because you, you have to look at different things. Basically, the reason we acquired the companies that we did is you, you kind of go, do I build or I do, do I buy yep. technologies? We kind of knew what we wanted to look like at the end state. It was part of our product strategy roadmap and, and our go-to-market roadmap. And we candidly would make a decision on what are we going to buy, what are we going to build. And, and a part of that would come down to if somebody has got a very interesting technology that could be disruptive, mm -hmm. or it's so expensive for us to try and catch up to what they had already developed, then it was kind of an easy decision. Well, let's buy somebody. Then it's a matter of who, who to buy. Uh, and so, you know, it, you really have to kind of go through that due diligence and understand what does the end state look like. And I always kind of had, had a tongue in cheek. Hope, is anybody here from France? Okay, I can say this. They don't want to admit if it. If anybody buys a French company, you know it's amazing technology because <laughs> it's such a it's such a pain. It's hard. It, yeah. It's hard. Yeah. But I mean, just their their labor laws and acquisition laws and things like that are really really hard. But you know it's amazing technology. Um, but you know when we I've actually been through this two times now. We did this within Documentum because Documentum was the first acquisition, and I was fortunate enough to be selected to lead the group then to help build out the rest of the product roadmap. Mm -hmm. And we really, you know, knew what the, the end state needed to look like. And what we were really focused on was content management at that time, which was kind of a, 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 a new thing with unstructured content. And so we knew all the pieces that we had missing. And candidly, some of that was part of the reason why EMC bought Documentum, because we already had some of that laid out mm. of how we wanted to evolve. And we, we had, uh, had documented, had done a convertible note to help fund some of the acquisitions and that. But it went on steroids as soon as EMC acquired us. And then we went down the journey of acquiring the companies. Um, there's a scientific or technical part of an acquisition, as you well know, yep. and then there's the art form part right, of it. Right, right. And the, the, you know, the, 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 the difficult part was the, the, the culture meshing in that. And we really, I, I was very proud of the team because we had a very repeatable yet flexible framework to be able to do that. So as a company was acquired, there was a communication plan, there was, you know, how do, how do we, you know, integrate these people into the, the, the uh, organization? And candidly, not everybody always integrates. Right. And, and so how do you communicate that in a positive manner and, and such? And then how do we integrate the code sets and things like that? So it, we had a pretty darn good repeatable model. And so when our goal was once the acquisition was made within 12 months, a code set was, mm. you know, integrated in there. And, and, you know, sometimes you had to re-engineer. Sometimes you could... Uh, you know, write interfaces, but from a customer user experience, it was an integrated product. So, and then at uh, Adobe, very much the same thing. Um, you know, it was a lot of acquisitions, especially on the digital marketing side. Omniture was a, right. a huge acquisition. And then, you know, we had Day Software, which was probably, in my opinion, the best acquisition that we did at Adobe. Um, and then just a, a ton of smaller ones. So, yeah, I think, you know, as a, again, being a small, companies selling to bigger companies. I did yeah. that several times. A lot of it, I, I think we spent as much time trying to focus on the culture of the bigger company and deciding yeah. if that was going to be a mesh with us, our culture, or not. It's part of the due diligence. Yeah. yeah. And I think we did. I mean, Citrix is the is the real big one here in the Santa yeah. Barbara County from the biggest employers now. And that was part of our concern was, you know, are they going to keep people here? Are they just going to try to pull everybody back east? And, and they, they did what they said they were going to do, which was allow us to grow the company here. But you never know yeah. until... Well, you've probably so seen that done. too, where I mean, there's always the fear of the unknown. And when you're acquired, I mean, you're staying awake at night looking at the scenes like, yeah. what does this mean to me? What right. am I going to do tomorrow? And I think it's so important for both companies to have fair, open communications prior to any oh, announcement yeah. on that of what's the protocol around the communication plan. The employees are going to retain. A lot of times there's, you know, as you know, retention programs and things like that right. to make sure that they stay on board. And then the people that don't have a job, how do we, how do we create a soft landing for them? How mm -hmm. do we, because you don't want to destroy that culture because yep. you're right. You know, is we try to buy amazing technologies, but I, I do this as an investor and I think you probably do too, John. I invest in people. Right. I see amazing technologies out there, but if the people can't execute, if the people don't have a vision, if they aren't able to articulate that, it gets a lot weaker. Yeah, I agree. Let's take the next student's question. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us today. Oh, thank you. Um, we talked earlier about some of your mentors, but I was wondering how you yourself evolved into a mentor and eventually was able to help other people at Adobe and in other parts of your career. Yeah, uh, uh, 
one, I don't know exactly when that transition took place, but I, I <laughs> is, is, is my wife will tell you, I've always been very much a believer in my heart of giving back because I came up from, you know, I shouldn't be where I'm sitting today based on, you know, how I was raised and that. So I count my blessings every day for that. And so I always, I'm a big believer in pay it forward. And so, you know, I always try to help people out. Um, and I think as a leader, it's so important to re remain humble. And, you know, hiring is such an important thing. I always do my very best to hire people that are smarter than me. So I'm hopefully mentoring them on how do we grow as an organization, how do we maintain that strategic uh, vision, and how do we execute and they're helping me grow by help challenging me with you know some of their skill sets, their knowledge, and things like that, and pushing me. Um, but you know the, the the thing on mentoring is it, it should just be part of what we do. You know, and and each one of you should be mentoring somebody now. As as some of you know, I'm very heavily involved in the United Boys and Girls Club, and you never know when that one kid just gets that lucky break. And, and we've all probably had that happen to us is there's that one moment in your life. You don't know when it right. happened at that point in time, but all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, things got easier. Got, got a little you know, tailwind here. And so, you know, it can start today. You know, so if you guys get a chance to go out and meet with kids in a Boys and Girls Club or a Girls Inc. or, you know, things like that, you should do it. Uh, I think it's just part of us as a culture, as a society, that that's how we improve. Um, and so, you know, the, uh, being a mentor to me is an honor. It really is. Um, because uh, I, you know, hopefully have something that I can help that person with. But my litmus test for success of whether I was a good mentor is, is did I help them get that break? Mm. And so, I don't know, that's a very long-winded answer to your question, but, but I think we should all be mentoring. Well, sometimes, and I agree with that, you guys, it's never too early to mentor. Yeah. In fact, my class, which is a lot of freshmen and sophomore, yesterday I said, go mentor high school students. You know, yeah, absolutely. there's always somebody in that pecking order that you can help. But we need to know, we need that feedback sometimes. So the other thing I'm going to encourage all of you to do, I've done it, and I've had it done to, you know, to me, which is wonderful, is, is remind a mentor of the help they gave you. Yeah. Reach back, and I've done this with people that I crossed paths with 15 years ago, and in some cases they were shocked. Like, Wow, really? I didn't realize that that had such an impact on you, or that I was that it helpful. It makes your day. Oh, completely, <laughs> completely. Yeah, I get yeah. those. I love those emails. But you guys should do that too. If there was somebody in high school, and anybody watching, if there was somebody in high school that helped you, or even if it was 15 years ago, and you're in your halfway through your career, you'll feel better doing it, and they will definitely feel better. Yeah. And it just it's just that virtuous cycle of encouraging that kind of behavior because we want that behavior in our societies. This is that's the right kind of behavior. Yeah. Everybody benefits. Yeah. So I want to talk about, you're taking some time now from Adobe and you're capturing your thoughts that you're going to be able to share in book form and online, et cetera. Talk to us a little bit about what are, what are, the, what are your goals with the book? What are you trying to get across uh, to, to folks yeah. that read it? So the book that I'm writing is, so at, at Adobe, we started a journey um, to really change the way that we did business. And, and the book is really what I see as the kind of the, not, in state's not the right word because I don't really believe that there's an in state. Um, but what, what does that next step look like? Now I'll give you a little flavor of it is, we see it, you know, we always hear the terms B2B and B2C. My feeling is that there's always a business. C. Business to business, business to. Business to consumer. It's consumer. There's always a C. So, so we, we, we've got to figure out, you know, what, what's the, the way to do that. The business to consumer marketplace, I think, has actually evolved a little bit faster in that I am the most horrible victim of Amazon one click to buy mm -hmm. in the world. I love to buy yeah, stuff. Right. I, I can hear you guys do it too. Uh, but, you know, I hate it when somebody tries to sell me something. Yes, is that fair? Right. I mean, how many people here like to go in and buy a car? It's painful, right? It's just... And so the thing that I found with our, our large customers, and, and fortunately Adobe had some really great customers, is the way that we interacted with them and the way that we did business was different than any place I had done before. So one is we spent a tremendous amount of time and effort on understanding our customer. And really, you know, not just you know, who they are and things like that, but what are they doing with the products? How are they using them? How many people are using them? What departments are using them? What are they using with those? What happens in the workflow after they've done their work with them? And really understanding what 
their businesses. And then because of that, it gave us a glimpse to say, understand their workloads, understand, well, could we help them here? Could we help them there? So when we had an interaction with a customer, they listened because there was value from it. And it's like, one, you understand me. Two, you're telling me something that I didn't already know and a way to possibly approach this problem that I may or may not have yet. Mm -hmm. And then in three, it developed a trust factor. Um, I'm personal friends with a lot of those people that I did business with oh, for sure. 10, 15 years ago. Yep. And so the book is really focused on, on how do we create an environment where it's not selling? Because I don't think people like to be sold to. And so, you know, so, so the, 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 you know, that interaction is one aspect of it. And it, another aspect is that there's not a sales organization in the way I see it in, in the future. Um, in, in, in Adobe, and I hate to keep going back to Adobe, but I have a lot of experience. Hey, <laughs> we want to learn from it. Yeah, uh, is that we hired people out of industry that did their jobs. And so uh, I, I ran multiple divisions within there. One of them was the media and entertainment division. One of the guys that was part of my team won an Oscar. Mm. And so you have somebody that sits down with a movie studio and he's talking about here's this, here's this, you know, video workflow or audio workflow or something, and he's got that Oscar <laughs> in there. They listen, <laughs> right, you know? Right, and and right. well, but it, it's because they have respect saying, this guy has done my job. He mm. knows what he's talking about. He's looked at the technologies and been able to come back to me and and, and add value. So it's it that's not selling. That's consulting, that's advising. Yep. Solution. Um, yep. And then we develop targeting methodologies so we're just not wearing our customers out. We would only go to them when there was something relevant and timely or disruptive that we should go to them and talk about so we didn't wear the customers out. Because what I see happen in, in sales organizations, John, I don't know if you see the same thing, people just blast things out. Right. You know, and you know, the product teams come out and say, here's the campaign we have for product X for this year. Here's the key value propositions. Here's the messages. Here's the go-to-market you know, uh, uh, campaigns we're going to have with it. And it's just kind of a shotgun approach. And I just, I hate that. Yep. Um, and so we, were, we would, what, what we called micro-targeting, where we would be very specific to a customer at very specific times within their life cycle on very specific messages from people that understood their problems. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a far more elegant process and it's, it's, it's a, a far more successful process because a lot of sales organizations, they, you know, they, everybody has the cold call metrics as so you make a, you know, 100 phone calls, yep. you get 10 appointments and two sales. We were down to like for every two meetings would result in, in, in a sale. And, and I mean, the, the, the numbers were staggering. So, so the book is really intended on what, what's the next state of that look like? How do we evolve as, as, uh, as, as a software or technology industry, because it is focused around technology, to get to that point where it's a far more elegant process so people are buying because they want to, not because they're being sold to. And let's be candid, there's a kind of a general distrust of salespeople. So, Well, I think it's, I'm looking forward to the book, because I think uh, brute force method is easier because it's sort of a playbook that's been written many, many generations ago and you just yeah. throw people at it, throw money at it and bludgeon people to death. I think what you guys did is more difficult. It's harder. It takes it some finesse. Hard. It takes some patience. It takes, you know, turning over rocks that don't result in anything you know, worthwhile. Yeah. But going back over and over and over again and without going to the same customers too often. Well, and there's some innovative models out there that, that I really have a lot of respect for. Uh, does anybody here use Slack? I love Slack. And the thing that I like about Slack is that they just now are hiring a sales force. I don't know how closely you watch them, but uh, it kind of caught us off guard within Adobe because- People just started using it? They just started using it. Yeah. And, like and Dropbox. And yeah, and so by the time the salesman actually called on us to do an enterprise license, it was a little too late because they already had hundreds of users. Yeah. So it's, it's more of a negotiation whether or not, you know, of what the price is versus do we want to buy it. But I think that's, that's an interesting thing too that I'm going to be addressing in the book of, in that case, it's the product team that's selling. Mm -hmm. And they're addressing, they're getting to their end users through content marketing, they're getting to their end users through their license models, right. and how they communicate with the customer. And it's completely different than a lot of other companies. But you know, like I said, Dropbox is another great example. Yeah. Well, go to meeting, I think we did the same sort of thing, yeah. go to my PC where, it's you know, look for solutions that you can get individual users to adopt, 
And then you, you get critical mass, you can go to the Montes of the world or the CIOs, the people that buy technology within a company, and it's, like you say, it's more of a negotiation over price as opposed to do you want this. The old way of selling was you would go to the, you'd start at the top, right? You had to go top down. Yeah. It's just painful and hard, and especially for a small months. company. It takes many months. Whereas if you can just get people using it, within the organization, then you already have momentum when you go into the conversation. Yeah. And I think where a lot of companies struggle with that is that I want that million dollar sale versus yeah. I can live with a hundred five dollar sales yeah. because that will turn into a thousand, turn into two thousand. So it's it's really starts at the top of the company of culturally how do we want to I always like go to the, market. I always like the forty nine ninety five you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of those small-time customers. It's um, that one click to buy. One trial, yeah, <laughs> click, click, trial, buy. That yeah. was, that's what we did. No, uh, it, it's funny because, I, you know, by time we realized how much we were using of some of these technologies. Right. I mean, those were some pretty interesting meetings internally with, the, you know, the controller, and that's like, we're spending how much? And right. let's be honest, employees figure out a way to pay for it. Right. You know? They get reimbursed. <laughs> they or, get reimbursed. Yeah. And, and so by time it got to me, it was pretty much already out of control. Yeah, about at one point, about sixty-five percent of our customers were just charging it in every month. Yeah, which which was great because they didn't really care how much we charged yeah. them. Um, so, who do you think is the target for this book? I know you're still writing it and it's yep. evolving, but who do you see as the target market? Like, who's the readership? Um, it's 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 really a, it's it's the product uh, management, it's the marketing organizations, and it's the sales organizations and their respective leaderships, because. The, the, the ones that I see having the most difficult time are the product groups because they're really focused on what are the, the, the capabilities, the features, the functions. And, and more and more they're getting away from that, but right. there's still kind of that, that culture of, you know, we come up with this cool stuff and if we build it, they will come kind of thing. And some companies are better at it than others. Um, marketing, I think, this is, this is one area of the book that I think is probably going to be the most controversial is that I can actually see a scenario where sales is rolled into marketing at some point. Because marketing right now is kind of the darling out there, the CMO is the target customer with everybody, and you see that. I mean, it, it is with Adobe, it is with Salesforce and Oracle and everybody. And the capabilities of the CMO today to understand their customer, to be able to analyze their customer, and where I think the real opportunity is in predictive analytics, yep. and that's an area that we were really working hard on, is to be able to think about what the customer is going to do before they realize what they're going to do. And that's all happening in the CMO. And, and so, you know, it, 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 I always get fascinated in, in the news articles, like uh, uh, with the Snowden incident where, you know, the government's spying on us. Trust me, all the marketing companies know 10 times right. more about what you're doing than, than the government does. Um, but, you know, I can see a scenario where sales becomes an execution component of marketing. Mm. And, 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 and it depends on the product, depends on the market sure. and the go-to-market strategy, but that's, that's a very real uh, scenario. Now, the other thing that's helped facilitate that is software as a service, because if you look back even two, three years ago, people would buy you know, a, a, a large, and I'm talking about the large enterprises, but even small and uh, SMB size companies, small medium business, they would buy the software and then you'd have an Accenture or a Deloitte or right. somebody come in and spend two to three years implementing it and customizing it. Yep. Um, and I think today you see software as a service where you know, I, I download an app and it works. Yep. And, and, I, and so that really disrupts the sales model because there's far less consultation goes. The customer has spent, you know, 50% of the time before you even walk in the door doing their due diligence and understanding that. So it's, it's really, you know, how do I address that? So, I mean, I'm trying to capture all that in the book and provide, you know, some thought-provoking uh, concepts of how you might deploy that, giving some of these dynamics in the marketplace and hopefully a roadmap that some companies might look at and say, hey, that, that may make sense. I want to try it. Right, right. We'll get the next student question in one second. I want to follow up with, I, I would imagine that working with the small companies, and I know a couple that you've worked with, is informative to this whole process of writing the book because they're, act, they're actually out there trying yep. to do it. You know, obviously, they're selling software, they're marketing software. Yep. Um, how, how, is that, how have those interactions been for you? How rewarding have they been? How different have they been from 
what you were doing when you were at the top of Adobe? Well, we'll find out in a few months as to how the companies <laughs> do. But, but no, I mean, I think the good thing is... Well, the feedback has been great, by the way. Oh, that's good to hear. Yes, they love Monty. <laughs> Give us more Monty. Yeah, no, I'm on three advisory boards now for local companies. But um, it, it's the thing that I... I, I kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. I look for the people in the company first because I want to work with companies that I'm very passionate about and genuinely want them to be successful. Right. I'm not in it for the money. It, and, and then that's one thing I, I would encourage everybody to do. If you start a company so I can make money and go buy cars and boats and houses and all that, don't do it. Um, you got to do it because you have a passion that I want to change the world with this, or I want to make my mark with this, or I want to provide this capability. Uh, and if you do the right things, the money will come. I sure. think you, you, you've seen that. Yep. Um, so you know, I, I think what I've seen from the companies when the boards I've talked to is, one, we've got some amazing talent right here in Santa Barbara. And I really want to make sure Santa Barbara becomes a very strong technology hub. And that's a lot of the reason why I'm doing it. But you know, some of the things, you know, that some of these concepts and that, I think we're going to give it a try. Because one of the problems you see in companies as they grow, the sales organization is one of the single most expensive organizations to a company. And, you know, sales reps get paid a lot of money in today's world. I think that's going to change, mm -hmm. but they do today. So if you're a CEO of a $50 million company, that's a big decision to hire a sales rep that's going to make two, three dollars $300,000 when I could hire, you know, maybe a couple engineers or something. So... I think there's an, 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 um, uh, an acceptance of some of the concepts. I think there's a, a, an interest in innovating together, and, and that's part of the advisory process that I'm providing, is it's not just, here, go do this. It's, right. let's, let's talk about how this might work within your company. There's one in particular that, I think you know what I'm talking about, it's just, this is going to be a home run. I, I can just can feel it. <laughs> I think we can say the name. Give the a HD shout data. Out. Yeah. yeah, HD, HD data. data. Remember that name. Yeah, now that, that is a company that I think could be the next yeah. billion dollar company here locally. Yeah, and, it's got uh, an amazing possibility. Craig Harris, his, Craig Harris and his team, uh, they're just doing a great job and, and I'm fortunate to be you know, an advisor to them and hopefully we'll help guide them through that. But I mean, some of these models we've talked about, that's, we're going we're gonna to try it because it will give them a, a level of penetration and give them a level of market acceleration that they wouldn't realize with a conventional sales model. Right. Now, it's a gift for a small company to have access to somebody like you because we're often trying to get to people like you. Yeah. And we don't, you know, if you're not in our circle, it's hard to really understand your world. So they are getting a lot of value from it. Well, it's funny because Craig and I had lunch uh, before I left for Europe last week. And, and you know, we were talking about it because it's like, I am your target customer. Mm -hmm. But your job is to blindside me. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> is that I don't want to know how much of your software I'm using until it's too late. And, right. and that's, that's, you know, it, and they've got you know, a product that I think will do that. I do want to get the student question, but I've got to follow up one other thing. So you mentioned the, that you think salespeople are probably going to get less compensation as we move forward. Is that going to shift more to the marketing side of the equation? I think so. Um, that's why I said this will probably be the most, uh, you know, discussed part of the book. But I think... You know, the, the, the sales model, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I'd sit in a meeting. So at my level, whenever they're, you know, we, we close out a quarter, you have an earnings call, and we have to prep the CEO and CFO for the earnings call, and we'd put together our notes. And part of the notes was always what were the biggest deals and give us the color behind those deals and things like that. And this wasn't, this is every public company does this, so it's not unique to any one company, is that the CEO will go through the deals how much did we pay the rep for that? Mm. And, mm. you know, there's thresholds where checks have to be signed off on <laughs> right, and right, right. comp plans reviews. It, it's, 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 in my opinion, not sustainable. Mm. Now, there is a segment of the market that's still that very high end, that's a very consultative, yep. an implementation type process that will still require that. But I think in a lot of the products like we're talking about with HG data and things like that, I just I don't right. see a place for that kind of model. Well, there certainly is a shift in the in the power within organizations between sales and marketing. So we've seen the you mentioned the CMO, the rise of the data driven CMO. Like anyone in this room here, most of the young people watching this, you would be a data driven CMO. In the old days, the CMOs were often brand or design people. Like they had a good brand aesthetic or they had a good design aesthetic, but they didn't know the numbers. It was very subjective. Yeah, it was, well, that's why they got away with it, right? They, yeah. But you, you can't get away with that now. You have to know your numbers. So I can, that's why I, I wanted to touch upon that point a little deeper because I, I totally agree with you as 
as it becomes less art and more science, I think a lot of that money is going to shift into those scientists that are doing marketing as opposed to the well, writing and, copy and, and picking it, colors. It's, it, the data is irrefutable. Yeah. And, and so it's not a matter, was that the right call? You look at the data, and I think the, the, the thing when you start, the, the problem with the data today is it looks today and looks backwards for the most part. I think where the real opportunity is that predictive analytics marketplace, and there's some companies that, there's a, one company I'm particularly interested in called EverString that mm -hmm. is starting to get into more of that predictive modeling that. Um, I think that's where the gold is. It's not gonna be scientific, but I can't tell you how valuable it would be as a, a leader to be able to say, this is what the data tells us we should be looking at of yep. where this is going. Right. Doesn't mean it's going to be right, and and, and and I mentioned it earlier with with the group is, I always surround myself with really good people. I'm a total data geek. I mean, I lived in spreadsheets, um, but I always told my teams I want everybody's opinion. It's an open table. Everybody throw your ideas out. There's no bad ideas, but I reserve the right to make the final decision. Right. And and so you get as much data as you can. You get as many good ideas and inputs uh, from your your organization that, and people you trust, and then then you know. It's a much more restful night's sleep when right. you got decisions right. based right. with things like that. And I think it's I think it's early days. It's early innings. Totally I mean, early think days. about lead scoring ten years ago. Oh yeah, it was a joke compared to lead sense. scoring today. Yeah, I mean, it did on paper, but it really didn't. Right yeah. now, you can actually do some good lead scoring. All right, I'm finally ready for you. Sorry to make you wait. What advice can you offer for working productively with people that you quote unquote hate doing business with? So you read my blog. I did. <laughs> so I did a blog called I Hate Doing Business With You. And this is actually a true story. And I'm, I'm still friends with this uh, gentleman today. He was the CEO of Condé Nast. So they publish you know, all sorts of magazines. And there's a guy named Joe Simon. And, um, but he was one of my first meetings that I had at Adobe. And, and sat down with him, he was like, Monty, I love your products. For the most part, I like your people, but gosh, I hate doing business with you. And, and what it meant was is the only reason he was doing business with us because he needed and wanted the products, but it was such a painful process that we probably were losing business. And it was very hard to introduce new products or new services or new capabilities because it's like, oh, God, I'm going to, you know. Shoot right. me now. Right. And so we were really you know, focused on, and that was kind of the, 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 the notion around the blog of, you know, how do I create a great product, but how do I create an elegant customer experience? You, you, if those around me you hear me use the term elegant a lot. And, and the reason I use that is because we've all seen that with different products and different services and different interactions we have is you know, they make it so easy to do business with them that you'll go back and do business with them again because it was such a great experience. And, and you're willing to look at other products and do other things with them. So to answer your question, it was really not that I don't like doing business with, with other people, but if you're starting your own company or developing your own product and that, don't forget about that. Yeah. You know, do the best you can. and. That there's two things I was really focused on uh, was the user experience of the product because I've seen some amazing technologies with a really horrible user experience. People won't use them, and the products are, have a really hard time. And I've seen some really horrible technology with just a really super user experience, and people use it. Yeah. So you, you've got to have a great user experience, but then you have to have a great in, in, in interaction with the customer uh, the term that we always used was, you know, delight the customer always. And, and, and that's even more important today because if you looked, you know, a few years ago, like at Photoshop, you'd pay your $700 for Adobe Photoshop. You may not buy it again for three or four years. If you're in a subscription, you have right. to be delighting that customer every month. Right. So that doesn't mean just with the product you use, but how I interact. How do I get my updates? And, and things. We did cut back on the number of updates for those of you might wonder. <laughs> well, I, 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 I use different language, but same sentiment. Would, yeah. you know, small companies need, I think, re they need to rely on the bro factor. Like, I have everything against me. Like, how am I going to sell to Adobe? Yeah. We did actually sell to you guys early on. Yeah. How would I be able to sell to Adobe? I'm just a small little company in Golada, California. Nobody's ever heard of me. And, and so young people just have to really understand, be, it's OK to establish these <laughs> or friendships and rapport and, oh, yeah. and, and sort of this bro factor, because you are going to stumble as a small company. And if they, 
if they have your back, then they're going to let you stumble a little bit. If they don't, if they don't like you and they don't have your back, then that's the first time you stumble, you're out of there. You just gave an excuse to beat you up. Exactly. The door. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to go to you, but I've got um, uh, a question that I that I I try to give advice on. So I'd love to hear your advice. So young people, when they come into an organization, they have this difficult balancing act. They don't want to they don't want to sound like a braggart or they don't want to toot their horn too much. But if they don't ever toot their horn, then it might yeah. be hard for people in the organization to really appreciate them. How have you seen that done well? And you've worked at big companies where people yeah. really have to stand out to be noticed. It's, it's a tough one. I think, one, you've got to put yourself in a position to be noticed. Um, I saw too many times where people would, you know, just they, they want to kind of stay off in their, their cubicle or their office and, or, you know, or whatever. And, and you can't do that. Um, there, there's one individual uh, that uh, I, I've known this guy since he was seven years old, and I think my wife knows who I'm talking about here. I've known him since he was a kid, and he was just you know, super smart guy. But you know, we, we we hired him into Adobe. He got his MBA in finance, and I put him on this analytics team. And what he would do is is did amazing work. But then the recipients of that work, he would always reach out to us like, hey, did you understand this? Did you notice that we did this? Because mm -hmm. when you're dealing with the volumes of data that we are dealing with, right. it's real easy to kind of get lost in the noise. But he would just have that little, and it wasn't big. It wasn't big, but hey, did you notice that we've now captured this data over here? Or we're now able to extend this out over two years versus a year. And I was always amazed. And he would always do more than what I asked him to do. Right. And he's probably the best example that I can think of, but I think the thing is it's, 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 you know, I was his customer. Right. You know, and it gets back to delighting the customer. I was going to say delight your boss, delight yeah, your customer. Yeah, yeah, and, but you can't be, you know, I've also seen the, the ones that follow you around at conferences no. and that you can't no. do that. No, But just, you know, do, the, do your very best and then a little bit more and then make sure people understand what was that little bit more that I did that amazed them or yeah. delighted them. I like that follow up. That's a good. That's a good concrete tactical thing you can do. Yeah. Hey, I wanted to make sure that you got that or understood that or did you know that we could do that? Um, I always say one one secret to success in business is make your boss's job easier, and that's not brown yeah. nosing, right? It's not kissing it's not. their butt. It's just finding things that they don't like to do or you notice they don't really have time to do and saying, hey, look, I won't do it as well as you, but can I try to do that? Can I? Can I yeah. take a shot at that? Yeah. Most bosses will love that, even if you're not quite as up to speed, you know, and, you, and yeah. they have to work with you a little bit. They're going to appreciate that. So that's well, a, and I always, uh, I was very fortunate in that I had a, a, a good team where people would ask us, like, "Hey, you know, can I sit in on that?" Yeah. And I always cultivated my leaders. I was very uh, focused on growing people from within. The only time I would hire from the outside is if it just was either a completely new mm. capability that we never. Had, 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 but what I would do is I would take, you know, people in first line, and we, it was usually six months to a year, and I would say, hey, I want you to come to our leadership meeting, or I want you to go get this training and that. So mm -hmm. it was a fairly seamless step for them when they would come in, and, you know, uh, in a publicly traded company, you do what's called QBRs, quarterly business yes. reviews. They're painful. Even do those in small companies. Okay, but, but you know what I'm talking about. Not, it's, not, it's, not at the same level. Yeah, but it, 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 it was a lot a lot of work, right. and the stakes were super, super high. You did not want to mess up at a yep. QBR. Yep. And I would always bring in you know, two or three of what I considered the high potential. Remember I talked about how I had that high potential management training program? My leadership team, I'd always say, identify one or two people in your organization that are your, your next leaders. Monty, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's been my honor. Thank you.